Hello everybody, welcome back to the Rust Beginner Tutorial on Coding in Crypto. So today, as we promised before, we're going to be talking about borrowing and references and dereferencing, which is kind of like the pent-ultimate rule in Rust, like one of the biggest things that sets it apart from other languages. Sure, we've got variations on different data types, different object styles, ways of like writing certain syntax, but this concept of references is going to be the difference maker, the number one reason why Rust stands out. So we're going to dedicate a whole video to it right now. And we'll start by demonstrating what is a reference. So we'll just do an example function here, function references. Now you've seen this operation before, but let's set this original value as an I32 equal to 20. Okay. So nothing out of the ordinary here. Now, we've also teased this a little bit. Let x equal reference original value. Now, what does this mean? I alluded to this in a previous video, but what this and sign means is we are going to borrow the value. So to borrow a value, you conduct a reference. So I'm just gonna put the and sign is a reference, and when you reference something, you borrow its value. Pretty straightforward. So I'll add that in the comments as we go. Borrow the value of original value. Now, to understand borrowing, we have to take a look at how the memory works in a typical application, especially a Rust application. Now, this is my like very haphazardly thrown together diagram of a stack in a heap. So don't worry about all the intricate details. I encourage you guys to go take a look at how the stack and the heap work to get some more context. But I'm gonna give you like a quick overview here so we can understand how this relates to some of the stuff we're talking about with Rust. So first of all, the heap is gonna be where most of your application's data is stored. That's where the main memory is allocated and that's for everything in your program so what rust does in most languages you have what's called garbage collection and the program will routinely check to see what objects or variables or what have you are no longer being used and it'll delete them from the heap to create more memory now in rust this is not done automatically you need to specify that so when we're doing things like referencing if we take the original value that we're referencing and we destroy it, which we'll talk about in a sec, then the heap space that is allocated for that object is completely freed up. If you change an object, you know, mutating it, things like that, you're going to create new space on the heap for that object and free up the old space. So it's going to change on the heap. And the stack is just a series of pointers that point to the locations on the heap for your different objects. So a basic example, if you create a string, a string is an object. So it has a value, but it also has a length. It also has like what kinds of byte representations each character are, what order they're in. Like there's a lot of attributes of a string, which is why it's represented by an object and not a primitive. So when you have something like a string, you have a pointer in the stack that will point to the heap that contains, or the area in the heap that contains the information about your string. The reason it's set up like this is because the stack is much faster to navigate. It's first in, last out, but it contains only pointers. So it's very, very quick to kind of like parse over. And then you just grab the pointer you need and it points you to the object and all of its attributes. That's what the application does at a very low level. Now, how that relates to borrowing. Well, as we said, each object and data type has its own location on the heap. So let's go ahead and flip back over to our example here. Now, when we're borrowing this value X, we're borrowing the original value and set it equal to X. What we're saying is, we're telling Rust, don't create a new space on the heap for this original value. And typically when you see this is when you're trying to 
reference of value from like a different scope. Like if we had like a for loop going here, or even if we just created a block scope here, basically this is a new scope. And each time you pull an object into a new scope or in a new function, or you do something to an object, like I said, you're gonna end up with new heap allocations and thus new pointers. The reference capability allows you to tell Rust, hey, don't do any of that. All we need is the value. So when we have like a string, like if we said, if we set original value equal to a string, and we said string from Dan, I don't know, some guy named Dan, and then basically what we're saying is, all we need is this slice Dan. We don't care about the length of the string. We don't care about the byte values of the char. So we don't care about any of that. All we need is this particular value to conduct our business here. So Rust is gonna say, all right, sweet. Like you don't need to actually go create all this new space. Sounds awesome. Now, this can be kind of tricky because you have to be careful about what you do with a variable that's referencing another variable's value. <clears throat> so let's take a look at what that kind of looks like. We already set original value to be mutable. So if we go ahead and say original value equals, and we just change it to a new string, let's just go with like Josh. Now that's perfectly acceptable because we've already told Rust that this value is mutable. We can change it anytime we want. Awesome. Now, what if I try to do this? What if I try to print out X? Well, immediately we get a value error here. Cannot assign to original value because it is borrowed. So that's super important to remember. We originally declared this value to be this string and whether or not it's mutable doesn't matter what in the context of referencing, like you have, you're responsible for that. Rust isn't going to do that heavy lifting for you. It'll throw these errors and stuff, and if you've got a good plugin, you'll catch it before you run it, but like your, it's up to you to remember and to see these things and to take care of the order of your references. So here we told X to point, to reference original value, and it was equal to Dan. Now right here, when we change that value, we have now freed up the original heap space that was representing the string of Dan, and we've created new heap space for the string of Josh. Now, X is not pointing at just the value. It needs to go through that stack first to go to its location on the heap. So X is really pointing to the stack pointer. And since we went and changed our heap space, this pointer no longer points to a valid entry anymore. Like the pointer that we were referencing here has now been freed. So you could either have completely freed up space in the heap that this points to or something totally different. So Rust is going to call you on that every time. It's going to say, hey, you are done with this value. Like you can't do this anymore. Now we can also try something like, all right, well, what if we just let X equal the reference again? Now that's cool, but that's because we're telling Rust, okay, reference it now after it's been changed. And now we're going to get that new pointer and it's going to direct us to the proper location on the heap. Now we talked about what happens if we change a value and we quickly mentioned destroying a value. So what does destroying a value look like? Well, it just looks like this. We mentioned that there's scopes involved in these heap allocations. So if we just create this destroy function and we have it take in a value that's going to be a string, and all we do is have it print out that string, that val, <clears throat> then technically what's happening is when we go and pass something from one function to another in here, we're moving it to a new scope and that's going to change the heap allocation. So check it out. If I go down here and I say destroy and I pipe in original value, nothing wrong with that right now. But if we try to go ahead and print X again after we pass that into destroy, you can't because this value has moved out of scope. So the heap has changed and we don't know what in this function that is going to be represented as. And especially since we're not setting an equal to anything, we're not getting a return. 
Like this is called destroying a value. We're moving it out of scope and Rust can't determine or guarantee that this reference is still going to be valid. It's still going to be the same as what we set up here. So pretty important to note. I know it's a lot to unpack, but as we go and as you see this and sign pop up more and as you use references a lot more and you can kind of read these errors and they're pretty helpful, you'll understand a lot more of like how to prioritize and how to like organize your references and make sure you don't get tripped up on this kind of stuff. And by the way, the ability for Rust to be able to check for this kind of stuff, it comes at compile time and it's called the borrow checker. That's what's going to generate these errors. And that's what's going to just take an initial look at all of your references and make sure that everything's in line. So you can leverage that borrow checker to really make sure that your code is solid. Now, we did references here, but we also briefly mentioned dereferencing. So what is dereferencing? Well, I'm quickly just going to add a note here and just say object is, quote, destroyed when it leaves scope. And now we're going to talk about dereferencing. So what is dereferencing? Well, as you can kind of imagine by its naming convention, it's sort of the opposite, like the reverse operation of referencing. So what this kind of looks like, the, the best way to kind of describe this, I guess, would be we're going to do two integer values. We're going to do let A equal 1, and then we're going to let B equal the reference to A. So we're just referencing that value like we did above. And now I'm going to just do an assert function. And this is just a test in Rust. Like we're going to assert that these values are going to be equal. So you can use this to do tests in your code. So I want to make sure that one is equal to X. And we, or I mean A, I'm sorry. And we set this up here equal to A. So that should come back true. We just saw we didn't do anything to it. And now what about B? Well, that'll work, but if you just add this key right in front of it, just add an asterisk right in front of it, what we're actually going to check here is going to be the original value. So this is called a dereference. So what that, um, I'll add a comment here. This dereferenced B is equal to A. So that's a little bit tricky, I understand, and you're going to see this in some use cases in the future, so it'll make more sense in some of the future videos, like especially when we get into like iterating over vectors and over arrays, you're going to see how powerful this really is. But the gist of it is that when you dereference a value, you no longer are referencing A, you are now A. So we're going to assert 1 is equal to A, and we're also asserting one is equal to A here by dereferencing B and assuming A in its entirety. Cool, so that's a dereference, super awesome. And there's a couple things I wanna mention quickly that are sort of related to this. Um, the first is going to be what's called a static value. So a static value is kind of a neat feature in Rust and what it basically means is it's a value that basically lives for the entire duration of your program. So you're basically telling Rust like, hey, don't worry about tracking the lifetime of this value. We're gonna set it equal to static. It's never gonna expire. So up here when we're referencing stuff, whenever we go to destroy something, like that is the end of life of that value. Anytime that the heap is changed or just freed up and not really reallocated, that is the end of an object's life. With a static, that life is perpetual. So to define a static, we're gonna just say let x, and we're gonna let it be a string slice, and we're gonna call it Dave. Now you haven't seen this before, and there's obviously a bunch of errors being thrown because Rust doesn't know that this is going to always be the same length. But when we incorporate a static call like we talked about suddenly this becomes okay because we're declaring this it's going to be static it's not going to change this particular representation of x here isn't going to change so let's see what that looks like if we set y equal to a reference on x and then we do that same destroy function and we just do x to string 
And now if we try to print out, like we did earlier, the value of y, which is referencing x, you can see that suddenly we don't have this error anymore. Up here we get this error, but down here we don't. And that's because this is static. It's not being destroyed here. So I'm just gonna say x, oops, x is not destroyed here. So this can kind of complicate things. You gotta be careful with statics because this can go into this function and if you returned it as something, you could possibly change the heap location, but typically what's gonna happen is you'll just create a new location. Like this won't change. You have to do certain things to actually determine the end of life of a static value. But for the most part, this is what it's kind of designed to do. I would use it at your own risk for now. It's something we're not gonna cover in too much detail in this tutorial, maybe in like more advanced topics in the future. Um, but I just wanted to cover it real quick in case you see it in this playlist. Anyway, there's one more thing I want to cover since we're on the topic of memory, and that's going to be the U size data type, which we didn't cover yet. So I'm going to say function U type U size example here, and we're going to talk about what is a U size. Well, a U size is another way to declare an integer, but the interesting thing about U size is it's actually dependent on the architecture of your operating system. So we'll talk about that in a sec, but I'll just show you here. If we just let X be a U size type and we set it equal to like, let's say two, you can see that that's perfectly acceptable. It's a valid data type for an integer. And like I said, it depends on your OS architecture. So whether you've got like an X32 or an X64 Basically what this data type is designed to do is it's designed to give you the guarantee that there's going to always be enough space in this representation to hold a pointer, like we talked about on the stack, for whichever size your pointer needs to be, whether it needs to be a certain size pointer for x32 or a certain size pointer for x64. That's basically the gist of it. And the number one spot you're going to see U sizes is going to be in like indexes and in lengths and in stuff that's going to describe objects on the heap. The nice thing about U size is obviously you, you can just use it as a declarative type and it's irrelevant which operating system that this program is actually being run on. So that's pretty neat. Figured since we were on the topic of memory, I would mention it. Now, that's about as far into the rabbit hole that we're going to go on memory and on Rust's like garbage cleanup type rules. So hopefully this was enough to kind of give you a good overview and give you a good introduction to references and some of the rules around Rust's memory allocation. This stuff's going to come up over time repeatedly as we do more examples and as we get into some example applications. So as with everything else that you're seeing for the first time in these videos, things will become clear as you see them in practice, as you see use cases and you could think about it logically. So appreciate you watching and check out the next video.